Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome. Um, thank you for coming to our panel discussion on Native American health today. We will be exploring the different perspectives and experiences of our panelists in regards to the five themes of the Native Voices, Native Peoples, Concepts of Health and Illness exhibit, which is currently on display during regular library hours until June 7th on the first floor of the library. The themes are individuality, community, nature, tradition, and healing. The U.S. National Library of Medicine developed and produced Native Voices, Native People's Concepts of Health and Illness, and the American Library Association Public Programs Office in partnership with National Libraries of Medicine towards the exhibition to America Libraries. Texas A&M University Commerce Libraries is very excited to host an exhibit with such an important message. After the panel, Everyone is invited to visit the exhibit in the library, and if you stop by from 3.30 to 4.30, Valerie will be very happily serving popcorn at the display and available to answer questions. So, if I haven't introduced myself, I'm Sarah Northam, and I work in the library, and I am very excited to introduce our panelists today. Um, first up, we have Miss Andrea Yarbrough. She is also known as Yanush Toby Ohuyo, and she is a graduate with a BS in Special Education of Texas A&M University Commerce, and she is currently a middle school, middle school special education teacher at Anna Middle School. She is from Atoka, Oklahoma, and is a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. She is also a member of the Mississippi Choctaw Nation, and the Quixata, no, Quixate, Quixati tribe. Did I just completely butcher that? Did not members, but I am. You am. Thank you. I you are. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting special with it today. Okay, so I apologize. <laughs> um, we also have with us Miss Yolanda Bluehorse on the end. She is a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe out of South Dakota. Her community work within the Dallas-Fort Worth area has consisted of advocating for better procedures within the Child Protective Services system, education of the use of Native American mascots and its effect on Native youth, and environmental protection. Her professional career path has been in the healthcare field for over 20 years, which began with her service in the United States Army as a laboratory specialist. Next to me, we have Miss Bonnie Smithers, and she is currently working in our nursing department. She has over 30 years combined nursing and teaching experience. Her educational journey began with becoming a licensed vocational nurse and has progressed through the Master of Science in Nursing. Her clinical expertise is in critical care nursing. She served 12 years in the United States Navy Corps and assisted in providing nursing care during the Gulf War at a 900-bed fleet tent hospital in Bahrain. During the course of her nursing career, Ms. Smithers is providing nursing care and intensive care, rehabilitation, urology, labor and delivery, a pediatric clinic, an immunization clinic, and many other areas. She has worked as an advanced practice registered nurse in busy neurology clinics in North Texas, Southern Oklahoma, and Maryland. And prior to coming to A&M Commerce, she provided nursing and clinical instruction to students at Del Mar, Del Mar College in Corpus Christi and at the College of Southern Meta Maryland in La Plata. For the last five years, she has been teaching in the Bachelor's of Science in Nursing program here in Commerce, and we're very happy to have her. And then finally, we have Miss Tamika Minter. Um, Tamika is a licensed professional counselor and multicultural specialist in the University Counseling Center. Um, she holds an MED in counseling from the University of North Texas, an MA in counseling, supervision, and education at Texas A&M University Commerce. No, no, wait, at Texas Women's Texas University. University. <laughs> I'm getting a little nervous, I think. Okay. <laughs> and she is currently pursuing her doctorate. <laughs> in Counseling, Supervision, and Education at Texas A&M Commerce. She has clinical experience in working with all age groups, experiencing trauma, suffering with co-occurring disorders or addiction in any form within inner city and rural psychiatric hospitals and school settings. She has worked as a certified school counselor, 
adjunct instructor, faculty member, and a licensed professional counselor for Richland College and North Lake College within the Dallas Community County Community College District in years past. Tamika's clinical specializations include multicultural counseling, depression, and anxiety disorders, addictions, and self-injurious behavior. So like I said, we've got some pretty stellar panelists today, and I'm very happy to welcome all of you. So if you don't mind, I'll get started with our questions. Okay. So our questions today are going to explore the core themes of the Native Voices, Native Peoples Concepts of Health and Illness traveling exhibit that's currently on display. So the first question we're going to look at is the individual, right? Um, how do Native American concepts of identity and inheritance impact understandings of health and wellness? And anybody can grab the mic and roll. <laughs> or I can sing, which would be really bad. <laughs> so I advise talking. Yes, absolutely. How do Native American concepts of identity and inheritance impact understandings of health and wellness? I feel like the stronger, I feel like the stronger a person's identity is within their tribe and within their family, the more that they're going to seek out guidance from their tribe, more than they're going to go away from that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I know with one of my cousins, him and his wife don't tend to be as traditional or believe as strongly in some of our traditions. Um, one of them being that when a woman is on her cycle, she is not allowed to touch the man or touch anything that he's touching at the same time or it could cause him to get very sick. And instead of uh, choosing to listen to what they were taught, um, she cooked dinner for him one night and thinking, you know, we want to, we're not going to listen to that, we're more modern, and he was actually very sick for a week, and so they realized maybe we should listen to our family. <laughs> All right. Um, how have you had any like? Has it impacted you in any way? You know, how has it affected you individually? I do know that whenever I'm not feeling well um, in any way, like emotionally, um, just in my heart, or even physically, um, I always go to my grandmother first and seek out her advice and. Um, sometimes she'll just pray with me, or she'll talk to the Creator, or she'll just seek out guidance um, by praying to the Creator and seeing what He recommends for us to do. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to talk about, you know, the concepts of identity and inheritance? I think it should be on. It should be being the operative word. Okay, I just turned it on. Let's see. We've got to get it. So I lied. One thing, my voice will travel. One thing that I've noticed, <laughs> one thing that I've noticed in a psychiatric setting um, is that there is a limited uh, drive to seeking services, uh, especially if the entire family is not included on the decision making process. And then leaving one's uh, loved one at the psychiatric hospital setting uh, is pretty much unheard of. So, the family would more than likely take that loved one home and utilize traditions and practices in order to heal them versus leaving them there in the care of our doctors that we have on staff. One thing I've noticed in the University Counseling Center as well as in a secondary and post-secondary counseling centers is the entire family would come in. And it wouldn't just be as a licensed professional counselor. You're treating just that said individual. You're actually working with the entire family. So do you think that it's because they identify the family unit as like the whole as opposed to an individual? Absolutely, and I think it's also about trust. A lot of it has to be about trust. And I've seen that in various other cultures as well, to include my own. Okay. Anyone else? Um, I, can, yes, um, I can add to what she's saying on the close-knit um, of the family. I remember my first year at the university, I took a psychology course and uh, one of the first questions she asked us, the instructor, was um, how many people were in our family? And so I started counting off my family, not realizing that she met the American view of the, the family, immediate my family. Yes, so when I think of immediate family, I think of my grandmother, my aunts, my uncles, 
is my first and second cousins. To me, my extended family is like my great aunt and her children. So it's more of a, like to me, I have me and my husband. So, you know, it would be like me and my husband and his parents and cousins and stuff like that. You. And she said, well, it should be just the people that live in your home. And I'm like, well, I live with my aunts and cousins and my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds, I mean, to me, that would be a lot more welcoming type of environment. Yes. It seems like you have more people to rely on and more people to trust in. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, if there's nothing else, I'll move on to the next thing. That's what's going on. Um, I'll move on to the next question. So community. What role does community wellness play in the overall scheme of Native American health? Um, is it more important than in the Western ideas of health? I think for Native people, it's the way we are raised, culturally speaking, you know, we're, as it, probably for any culture, but more importantly with us, we have a lot of um, family. It's very important, like she was saying, a lot of family there, um, which is one reason why a lot of our people go off to college and they never finish. They end up coming back. They end up going home. Um, community wellness unfortunately, is not always at its best on some of the reservations. As you know, with my people, we have really been knocked down over the last 100 years uh, since the beginning of the 19, well, before that, but around the 1900s, there was only about 250,000 Native Americans left on this continent. So we've been pretty much knocked down to our knees. Um, we've gotten back up right now you know, on, on some of the reservations, especially up north, as I am from up north, um, in, in the surrounding area, in the surrounding reservations, there's, you know, drug and alcohol plays a huge role. A lot of uh, depression, suicide, we have one of the highest suicide rates in the nation. Um, crimes being committed, murders against indigenous women. This is all taking place right now, and this is real. So we, our reservations are pretty much like a third world country here in the United States. Community wellness is, now that we are more educated, um, my people are, are learning how to live out here in this world versus the world that our ancestors, that you know, our grandparents came from. And it's, it's difficult because you have the Christian way of thinking, you have our way of thinking. They're two totally different worlds. Uh, so community wellness for us starts with the family. But if there is already things going on with the family, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see some of our youth on the reservations being exposed to some of the things that they are. Um, but I think that the more my generation that are becoming more educated and understanding how alcoholism works, how drugs are affecting people. It's beginning, we're, we're beginning to see a tide, a change, a change in the tide of, of what's going on. And, and while it's gonna take another couple of generations to overcome this and for those tribes who have the stronghold on their culture and traditions, um, that's honestly, I think, what's going to save us, is hanging on to that. Um, so as far as community wellness right now, honestly, it's not, it's, it's, it's bad. It's bad. Um, so, but I think we, we finally found a voice. We're coming out here and we're talking about it, where most of the time a lot of our people are very quiet, reserved people. So it's, it's, it's a good thing that's happening. So it's, it will come soon, hopefully. I wanted to follow up really quick. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was um, going and getting education, and um, how do you think that that could take an active role in kind of assisting your community and you know promoting 
ideas of wellness and such. I mean, I know and this is probably a bad comparison, but you know, they're always talking about in small towns, you know, children leave and then they never want to come back. You know, so is it kind of similar or do you think that people are actively taking an interest in trying to assist their communities? I think the the idea of you know leaving the reservation one it's a huge thing to leave right. especially if you've grown up there um, and a lot of people don't really want to go back because of the you know the experience especially the generations before my time you know my, my parents my you know what would be my grandparents generation the boarding schools the bad memories of what they what they had to go through and what they've seen a lot of them don't want to go back and I don't blame them you know it those boarding schools were really bad. Um, but I think some of them do want to come back. And if it was a lot of, of our people coming back in droves with education, then it, it would probably work. But unfortunately, right now, just a drop here or a speckle there of somebody coming back who's been out in this world. Because you have to understand, a lot of these like even the tribal governments, each each reservation or territory has a tribal council. You know, it's set up in a in a democratic way, um, but they don't have the experience about here and knowing what the resources are or how to even form a nonprofit or that you know you can go out and ask for donate. I mean, just the simple things that we're used to out here to take all of that knowledge and to take it back in there. We're just now learning how to do so. Yes, it is. You know, it's, it's important to to go back. You know, and help. But it's we're still getting on our feet. We're still getting on our feet. And I think you know, us being the smallest ethnic group in the United States. You know, we're we we don't get hardly included in anything. If you really think about it, um, we have. The, the statistics about my people are just now coming out. I and mean, especially, you know, as having more of a voice with what took place in Standing Rock. Um, so that's that's good. And we're becoming more educated. And hopefully, you know, in education itself, you know, the, the, again, the high school dropout rate on the reservations is very high. It's very, very high for someone to come and to achieve even a, a bachelor's degree is outstanding. I was reading a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2012, we're lucky if we put out 1,200 you know, PhDs across the United States. We're, we're lucky if we even get that many. So it's, it's, we're, we're getting there. It's, it's taking you know, a, long, a long time to do it, but um, definitely you know, when, when somebody gets to where we are educated to a degree and then maybe to our a master's and, and so on, Yes, I do think the people on the tribe want us to go back and help, so, um, yeah. And this wasn't mentioned in your bio, but you're actually currently working on your MBA, right? Yes, I am. I'm about, two, I have two classes left. Two classes left. I am the first uh, female in my family, my last name is Blue Horse, in my family to have gotten a bachelor's degree. And I will be the first female, first person, period, to get a bachelor's degree, and then uh, first one to get a master's. So I have a proud mama. <laughs> um, would anyone else like to talk about the role um, community wellness plays in Native American identity and health? Um, I did just want to kind of. I don't know. <laughs> technical difficulties, but we'll do our best. I just wanted to add more to what she was saying. Um, it is extremely hard to make the decision to leave your tribe. Because when you because when you go, it's like you're by yourself. You don't have that support system. Right. I like it. It's, it's hard for us to leave our families because you got to imagine even when I go to work in somewhere in the Dallas area, I'm like the only Native person there. You know, it's, it's, it's hard and then when we don't have our families nearby and we know how close and, you know, as all of us do, doesn't matter what color you are, 
but you know, our is like with her, she was saying she's so blessed to have so many cousins and grandparents, you know, all that. So. And I have got to say I'm extremely thankful that you're here today. No, no. Please. We'll just keep moving, okay? All right. Um, so let's talk about nature. Um, are Native American concepts of wellness more connected to the natural world than Western counterparts? And you know, why would why or not why not? You know, what impact do you think that has? Let me see if this is working yet. <laughs> you probably have to turn it off and then turn it back on. I think they time out. Then that's probably what's going okay. on. So I don't think it can y'all hear me back there? Okay. So um, years ago when I worked in uh, the healthcare field in South Dakota, I worked near Pine Ridge Reservation and also Rosebud at different times. And um, although I did not see any of the actual uh, nature practices, I knew they were there because the family would come in uh, they would pray with the individual. Um, one of the things I like to mention is that the family, actually, it was a disconnection because the family had difficulty traveling to the hospital or to the rehabilitation hospital to see their family. So uh, that is just uh, one of the hardships that the individuals face when they're uh, separated from their family and lack of transportation. Um, are there other ways that nature has an impact on, you know, traditional ideas of wellness in the Native American community? <clears throat> so a lot of, you know, well, obviously, you know, my people have been on this continent for a long time. And I brought some of the things here to kind of show you all. These are, you know, just a few of the things that we use um, from nature, from Mother Earth, for healing. Uh, our traditions, our culture, our spirituality are all about nature. Our ancestors didn't go to church, so to speak. There wasn't four walls. Our church is all about there. The sky, the stars, uh, different tribes believe in different uh, beliefs. Uh, for instance, my people, when we see the stars, it's a star nation. Those are, those are people. Um, the rocks, the rocks, when we see the rocks, the grandfathers have been around. We, those are our grandfathers. Our grand, our, they've been around for millions of years, so they have knowledge too. And every plant, water. The water is life, the mini Wachoni that you heard about, if you knew about what's going on up in Standing Rock in North Dakota with the oil pipelines and all that. Water to us is one of the most sacred elements of our ceremonies that we use. And everything in that is connected. You know how we're a percentage of over, I think it's like 80, 90 percent, we're, we're made of water. I mean, there's always, there's a connection. Um, but as far as healing properties, you know, in, again, with the different tribes, and I want to stress that because what I show you here could be different from her tribe. How she uses cedar or how, like, the, the, the southern Indians down here, they use things in a different manner than, than the northern Indians do, or the California. The California tribes out there, they, they use different items from nature, so to speak, um, for, their, for their traditions. It's, <clears throat> it's kind of hard to put into words, and that's why there's not a lot written about our healing practices. Our people do a lot of the teachings through word of mouth. It's things that are passed down within our people. 
It's not things that we openly share or do we have a camera, you know, um, when they're doing something that's healing, do we have cameras being allowed in? Some of our social dances, our powwows, we ask that people don't film at this time if there's something that's taking place. Uh, they're not to be watched in, uh, for entertainment. Um, and, and there's different beliefs that even go into that. Uh, for instance, and I know I'm going off topic a little bit here, but for instance, Chief Crazy Horse never wanted his um, picture taken for he believed that it would capture his spirit. But as far as healing and, and how it affects Native people, as far as, you know, with Western health, we have to depend on Western medicine because of the high level of diabetes that we have. Because, you know, a lot of, again, a lot of the people in the reservation, the food commodities that are being provided to them is horrible. And a lot of my people are overweight. Uh, we have, you know, diabetes is a killer amongst Native American people. Um, and until we learn to manage, you know, what, what manage it, which a lot of people either one, don't have the finances as she was saying, you know, or, or don't understand and, or don't want to go to a Western doctor. They want to stick more with the traditional ways. Unfortunately, keep continually eating the high, you know, high level have foods that have high level sugars in them isn't going to help. So, to some extent, we have to be more understanding because this is what's killing us too. So, um, but for the most part, a lot of a lot of it is dependent upon traditional healing and the belief it can. It, if you, I, on one hand, being in the healthcare field for so long, I can see, you know, why we have to have Western medicine. I see that, the medicines, uh, the x-rays, the machines, and all this. But truly, a true holy man, um, medicine man, believes in this no matter what. And that they have the power to cure, and they have. They have cured cancer, they have cured, and it's not only here in the United States or on in what we call Turtle Island, this is what we call the United States Turtle Island, not only here on Turtle Island, but in other countries too, that their beliefs has carried their healing. And so, kind of depends on how, how much you believe and have faith. And it's what it comes down to is faith. Um, um, Yolanda, thank you. And um, this actually does tie into the next two themes of tradition and healing. And I know I asked you about the items earlier, and I didn't think to ask if you wanted to speak about them a little bit, or if you just wanted to, to show them. I asked you know, other, a couple of other questions. Um, can you describe the items that you have, or is that something you, know, you would want to do um, that you brought with you? Would you like to? I'd love to hear about them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some of the things that I brought today, just to kind of give you a very basic, and by no means am I, you know, claim to be anything else but just a human being. The, 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 the tools and the gifts of healing and, and being able to help others is solely give to those individuals who have been prepared for it their whole lives. Our, our wakang with chasha, our, our medicine men, this is something that they, it is for them. But what I brought today is something that is commonly used in a Native American household. Um, and a lot of it has to do with like she was saying, you know, if you're feeling down and out, you know, for lack of better words, like I said, sometimes this stuff is hard to explain and to put it into, into words, into English, because it's something we feel that we know, just like, you know, the environmental, just, uh, the environmental work that I do, we know in here that we have to protect this earth. So talking about this, if I stumble, please forgive me, but, um, 
what I brought here today or some of the things like this is sweet grass right here and again and I don't I don't know her her tribe might be different again like I said all of our tribes are completely different not everybody has a, a, a pipe not everybody not every tribe uses a pipe not every tribe is the woman allowed to touch eagle feathers the Cheyenne people are not allowed the females there from what I've been told they're not allowed to have eagle eagle feathers um, but this is a fan and I think most of the tribes have fans. Um, depends on what they are made of. This one's made of, of eagle feathers. Um, but this is used, it can be used in various ways. Um, but a lot of times, like if you're needing to, what they call uh, smoke somebody off, let's use this for an example. What we do is we'll burn, <clears throat> we'll burn sage. And what sage does is it cleanses it's a type of cleansing the room. So we'll burn, we'll burn some, and I'm, I'm sure like you heard of what smudging is. Um, a lot of that was taken from, from our culture, from native people, and when we burn it, it, it cleans the room and it rids the room of bad things. So it's, it's always said to you know, smudge your home or you, know, um, or you can burn it and, and blow the smoke on somebody to help help heal them inside or whatever it is that they're having a hard time. The other thing that we also believe is that when it smokes like this is the smoke takes the prayers up. So, and and one of the things I learned too uh, was when it's, a, when it's a full moon, it's a good time to pray because that's when the, the prayers are really pulled up, really pulled up there. Um, so with the, you know, we, it, one of the, things too that's really hard you know when you have your relatives that are in a in a a non-native hospital like let's say if my mom or you know if my mom was or somebody I loved was in Baylor you know Baylor Hospital in Dallas for me to come in there and for me to light this up so I could blow smoke over my mom First thing would say, what are you doing? You can't have a light, you can't have that smoke in here, you know, fire alarms and, and, and what is what is totally lost there is like this is this is my belief, this is my religion. You know, so that 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 still is something that needs to be over overcome and hopefully it will one of these days. Um, I heard another elder from our community say, you know, she wishes there was a where place where when you go to the hospital you can go and pray. And I'm not talking about that little bitty room that they give people to pray in. You know, when we pray, we go outside. But there's not that. You know, or there's not a place where we can, what, how we say, offer tobacco up. Because people look at you, what are you doing? You know, but it, because it's not something you see every day. Um, the other, couple other things, like um, cedar, different tribes, again, burn cedar. Uh, and again, it's kind of a, like I was talking to my friend earlier today for the Chumash people out in California, the spirits like that smell. So when you want the spirits to come in and help heal, you'll burn that and to help them come, come, come and hear your prayers. Um, with also with the Lakota people, we have what's called a Uwebi ceremony where you know, it's it's there. We have ceremonies that call in spirits and call in people, call in the other side to come in and help whoever it is we're all praying for. <clears throat> and you see some amazing things. It's you know, out living living in this world where we see things, we have to see it, we have to read it, we have to be able to. But in in a native way you know that there's another dimension. There's a whole other side. There are people out here that are walking amongst us. There are things, like during the ceremony, the gourd shakers were flying through the air. There's, there's things that happen, and they're real. And for the non-believer, when you see them, they, then they believe. They, they know that there's something else. And those are the things that we believe that heal. So when we burn these things, they're from Mother Earth. They're, they're the flesh of Mother Earth. They're the, 
the, the hairs of Mother Earth. This is sweet grass. Sweet grass is also used in the same way. It kind of brings in the good and it sweeps out the bad. But this is the hair, what we call the hair of Mother Earth. That's why we braid sweet grass. Um, so there's just a few of the items I brought in. Um, this right here is something that the Aztec and the Mayan Indians in South America, the indigenous people down there, they use. It's, all, it's called copal. It's kind of the same thing as sage to smudge. So it, it's different. But we, we use these things. These are, these are what our ancestors have used for millions of years. And unfortunately, it wasn't until the Europeans came that we became exposed to more diseases, things that we didn't understand, that now we have to go to a Western doctor to become healed because it's their sickness, so we have to use their ways to get healed. But ultimately, ultimately, can you heal yourself? Can, can, a, can a medicine man come in and heal you? And yes, he can. You just have to have again that faith. Would, um, is, I guess I'll move on to tradition. Thank you very much. Um, what traditional Native American healing practices have you experienced or are you aware of? I know that you spoke a little of, of the items that you have with you. Um, you know, it sounds to me like what could Native American healing practices bring to the Western medical community. It sounds very much like it would benefit um, Native Americans who are currently in Western hospitals, you know, to be able to have access to some of the traditional practices. You know, um, what kind of impact would that have? <laughs> Everybody's looking at you. <laughs> Everybody feel free to answer the question. <laughs> process when a nurse admits the patient is to ask are there any certain cultural preferences or anybody uh, that we should contact outside the hospital and then um, from places I've worked at in the last 10 years there is more and more of an awareness and an ability to be flexible and to make arrangements for different things like you mentioned uh, so uh, in some of our simulations that we do with the students, we talk about uh, end of life, because they may or may not see a person die within the time that they're in nursing school. Hard to believe, but it just happens that way. So we try to expose them in simulation and talk to them about different cultures, not only about Native uh, Americans, but other cultures about how they view death and how they handle um, their, you know, and respect that person when they die in their spirit. Thank you. Um, actually, I'd kind of like to do a follow-up to both you and Tamika from the counseling field perspective and from the nursing field perspective. And not just, you know, traditional Native American practices, but there's all kinds of communities that have their own traditions when dealing with health and wellness. What impact do you think personally, you know, or have you observed has that had on those communities when they're allowed to incorporate that in kind of like their health or wellness journey? Yeah. I'm just gonna work with this. <laughs> okay, it's a fair pearls. fancy I like pearls. 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 Pearls work. <laughs> So I think uh, in, in that respect, when it comes to uh, creating a safety plan, uh, safety plans for those who are suicidal, uh, it's essential to ensure who's that support system, what does that support system look like, who's comprised of that support system, and who also could be a barrier to that respective support system. And when seeing that in a university setting, it does play a major role, especially in relapse uh, prevention for substance use. It also plays a major role in terms of safety planning um, when we're dealing or addressing self-injurious behavior or self-harming behaviors. Uh, in the psychiatric uh, setting, 
it plays a crucial role as to whom is that person going to go home to? Whom are they going home with? And what does that look like once they return home? And whether or not they are able to maintain some form of safety. Because oftentimes when we're doing treatment planning or even uh, let's say treatment planning in a university setting, we look at all the different factors that can contribute to aiding that person with their, their initial goals. You know, what are your long-term goals? What are your short-term goals? How do you plan to achieve those goals? And we go over that with them. But we also ask, do you have a support person during that intake session as to whom you identify as your support? How can they help you? How can they be a barrier to you in this process of counseling? We also see that in psychiatric setting. When we've gone from the biopsychosocial assessment upon intake, and then when we're doing their discharge planning before they are released, who is your person of contact? And then we do a family session. And if that said individual on the other end says, no, they can't come home with me. And, or they will not abide by the practices or customs or traditions of my household, then we have to continue to try and identify external sources to help them, whether it be for placement, for transportation, you name it. And then also identify what are some of those barriers and how can we help them even further. Would anyone else like to kind of follow up on tradition? I feel like sometimes uh, when you talk about uh, tradition, um, health, wellness, and then Western ideas of health and wellness, um, a lot of times people feel like they're two different things. Right. Um, but they very much so can be used in unison. Um, we have a, a medicine well um, because everything is always a circle. Your life is a circle from beginning to end. Everything is always a circle. There's always a whole being. And um, part of that circle is that you have your whole, your whole being that needs to be taken care of. You have your mind, you have your soul, you have your heart, you have your physical body. And sometimes um, in Western medicine, everything is so focused on like one thing or two things. But when we focus on our traditions of our, our traditions for wellness, um, it's very holistic. You have to focus on every part. So when you're ill. You know, you're not just ailing physically, you're, you're not just ailing emotionally because you lost someone, or um, mentally because maybe you're depressed, or any of those things. You're ailing, if you're ailing in one area, you're really ailing in all of them. And so you can combine some of our traditions with the Western medicine um, to have a more holistic approach. And to kind of encompass everything. Yes. So you're healing all of those areas. Well. Actually, would you like to, to say something? Uh, no, I think she you said it really well. Uh, <clears throat> all that I ask is, you know, just as, as something is when you see when you see native people out there, be understanding of what we've been through. Be understanding of 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 our of, of us. We're, sur we're surviving, because what was done to us was genocide. And we're surviving right now. And we're trying, and we're struggling, and we're trying to hang on to our ways. And I ask that people learn about it, educate about it, which is I'm, I'm glad that you guys had this forum. It gives, it gives us a chance to talk about, you know, a little about, about what our culture is, who we are, um, what we, can do with our healing what we can't do like we were talking inside of a hospital um, it gives us an opportunity we don't get it very much you know our people do not get a, a, a platform to speak on it that often uh, but when we do we're, we're very grateful for it so i ask that each one of you take a moment and, and look at the things that have affected us and, and look at what we've been through and, and try to understand that we, we're trying and you know because a lot of times especially you know with what's in the news with what Hollywood has portrayed with what the mascots you know we're not characters we're human beings and we have a tradition we have 
a culture, and we're here, and we're the first ones that are here, and, and we believe strongly in, in what Mother Earth has given us as far as, you know, coming from a healing perspective. And uh, we're doing our best to survive out here, out here, and while well, I hang on to that too. also to go back to what I wasn't able to finish oh, earlier. No. Um, one of the things, oh, a question I always hear from people is, uh, why are Native Americans still struggling today? Why is it such a big deal? It's It's been 100 years ago, or it was 20 years ago, or 10 years ago. Um, but one of the biggest things is that when for Native Americans to heal, um, it has to come from within and not from the outside. Um, if you think about um, a person that's been abused, um, if they've been abused by somebody, they don't want that person's help. They don't want that person to give them something. They're not going to trust them to help them and make them better. They have to do that within themselves. And so Native American communities have to heal within themselves. But part of going back to the community that makes that so hard is um, the decision for Native Americans to leave their tribe. When you leave your tribe, you really are leaving a very large piece of yourself. You're leaving your family, your community, all of those connections, and you're going into this new world where you don't know anybody, where you're just by yourself. Um, and the goal being to leave and bring everything back, bring your knowledge that you've gained, bring your experience back into the tribe. But it's a double-edged sword. Not only are you leaving that behind, and that's so difficult, but then when you go back, some people don't want to go back because they've seen how much easier it is out here. Um, once you become more westernized, to kind of forget your traditions and your culture um, and to embrace the American way instead of what you've grown up with. Um, and it's hard to want to go back to your tribe, especially if you have children like I do, um, to want to take them back to your tribe because you don't want them to grow up the way that you did. You don't want them to see the abuse and the suicide and the drug use that you did. You want better for them. You want a better education for them because the education is is horrible. So you don't want to bring them back to that, even though you want to better your tribe because they are a part of you. So you, you're pulled between your child and your community on wanting to help them, but not wanting your child to have the same that you did. Have to experience that. Exactly. And then there's a fear from the tribe when you have gone out into the world and you've become Americanized and you've got all these Western ideals that you want to bring back to the tribe. The tribe is fearful of that. They're like, you've just embraced our abuser. Why do we want you to come back? I think that is a very powerful note to be game closing our panel on. Um, would you, we have a little bit of time. If you guys would like to take maybe one or two questions from the audience, would you be open to that? All right. Um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Yes, ma'am, in the back. How, um, if you didn't hear the question, she asked how many different tribes are there? Um, there are around 564 to 66 federally recognized tribes, but not all tribes are federally recognized. There are way more than that. Yes, ma'am. What was... It goes back to an old story, and again, not every tribe has the same belief. But from my understanding of what it means, um, you know what? I'm not going to disrespect the story, and and because I might explain it wrong. Okay. I can see it. I can understand it, but I don't want to put it into words. If if it that this this land came up on a turtle's back, and that's about as far as I'll go with that. But I just really wanted to quick to explain too. When we say federally recognized tribes, the United States government had a really good idea when they when they made us when they began to write down our names, and that was a means to get rid of us. Um, when they started what well, they started the enrollment process and they started identifying the tribes in the United States, 
they started off with the blood quantum. How much Indian were you? So there was full bloods, you know, and then, it, then over the years it comes down to a half, then a quarter, then a sixteenth, and slowly over time, basically, you know, the treaties, some of the treaties you go back in history and they say that you're, you know, you quit warring with us, you move on to this reservation and we'll, we'll give you commodities, we'll help you, we'll give you a piece of land, we'll give you commodities. Um, they did that with the, with the known concept that eventually they wouldn't have to do that anymore because now that we're becoming so, such a mixed, you know, there's a mix of blood, eventually there won't be any full bloods left. There won't anybody be there, you know, a half, a quarter. It'll all get broken down and then the government has won. They don't have to help these people anymore. However, what the tribes are doing now is if you can prove your lineage. So that is, is sticking in place. So that's a good thing. Um, but when they're federally recognized, they're recognized by the United States government as being a tribe with, that, with, with an enrollment with a tribal government put in place. The, um, uh, the um, non-recognized tribes, are, there's a lot actually here in Texas, I've learned. Uh, of course, going more south, south of San Antonio, a lot of indigenous tribes down that way, very small bands of tribes but there's a lot of them down there. So there's there's actually a huge Native American presence here in Texas. They're just not as, uh, as recognized, I think, throughout history, unfortunately. Um, I'll tell you just real quick, one of the biggest shockers that I found out why the Texas Rangers are here in Texas. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and they're still around. Yeah. I kind of, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Within your community, is there one person you go to for medical help if there's not a doctor, or does each family take care of their own needs? I guess I'm saying, is there like a medicine man per community? I think it depends on your tribe and your family. Um, the closer the tribe is within itself, um, some tribes do have a few people that they go to. Um, but each family will usually have a person. Like my family, we all go to my grandmother. Right, and then you had one, our final question. Um, how would you go about teaching the Native American history in school uh, without um, disrespecting or uh, overgeneralizing? <coughs> disrespecting. Uh -huh. Yeah. As you teach it in school, it's only disrespecting or reorganizing the traditions of history. I don't think they teach the true history of what happened to my people in school books at all, to be honest. What happened to my people is horrible. I couldn't imagine being ripped out of what I've known as home. Imagine being in your home and the military comes and rips you out and throws you in a third world country. It'd be shock. Everything that you're used to is gone. You know, with the boarding schools, they're being put into a school. And I, what general? There is a general. There is a general, famous general. Kill the Indians. Kill the Indians. Save the man. Yeah. And that was. He's succeeding, because that's what I am today. I'm educated. I live out here. I have a car. I live in the city. Do I have all this? I have to struggle to get back to this. I have to go back to my own people. For me to go to church, what we call when we go to a sweat a nipi. That's my church. I can't just go down and into downtown Dallas and, and go find one. They're, they're hard. There's maybe just a handful of, of people who really honor the old ways in the state of Texas without me having to go back up north. The history books don't, doesn't teach and doesn't talk about the massacres that they've done, that the government did. Um, the killings, and it should, but the government is ashamed. There's a shame there. There's a get over it ideal. It was it was long ago. No, it's not because I'm still living it. My mother's still living it. There's grandparents out there that are still living it. Generational trauma is what it is. We're still struggling. We still struggle with, you know, with, with, with so many things 
and not just out here, but within the reservations too. So the history books doesn't tell everything, and Hollywood doesn't help. You know, Tonto certainly doesn't help. It's, it's really sad what has happened to my people, but it gives me strength because we're here and we're surviving and we're alive. My kids are here and we've been to ceremonies up there. And I'm proud of my people. The, the, the Sioux Nation is the only nation that has defeated the United States government on its own soil. And I'm very proud of that. All of the tribes were hard hit. All of the tribes from the East Coast on over were colonized. We didn't ask for this. We opened our arms up. And that's what even we do. We, we, we're like that. We give away. You know, we always joke if I ever won a lottery, I'd be poor in a matter of days just trying to help everybody. It's not about what we have, it's, it's how much we can give away. But the history books, doesn't, they don't tell the truth. And there's so many things, there's so many different massacres, there's so many people, there's, there's, there's so much of the blood that this government has on its hands from trying to destroy a nation of people who were here happy and minding their own business. So, as it is said, hopefully one day, no matter, you know, as long as we, as long as we, our people, we stick to our beliefs and we stick to protecting this earth, others, other people of other races or other non-native people will understand that. You know, there are other cultures throughout the world who believe this too. That protecting this earth is important and believing in it, so. Thank you. Um, we do need to wrap up, but I would like to give each of you just a moment to make, you know, if you had a few brief remarks in closing, I'd, you know, I'd appreciate it from all of you. I was just going to answer her question more directly. Um, I feel like to have, so that Native Americans are more included in our history, it would just be easier to have maybe a council of Native Americans that can work with the companies that create the textbooks. It's pretty simple. Yeah. There's several councils that should be created to help with textbooks. <laughs> Especially in history. Well, I definitely agree because um, growing up in Dallas, and I know that there are several whom uh, we have a connection because we either attended school together. Um, we did not have a rich feeling of any history outside of that which was taught to us. That was it. I knew nothing beyond what my mother shared with me about our family, what she shared with me about our connection to our Native American ancestors. Um, I knew nothing about American history outside of the three uh, that we were taught. You only knew about Harry Tubman, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks. That was it. You knew nothing about Native American history outside of the pictures that you were shown in the textbooks. So I agree. We need to do more than just illustrate uh, a facade that has been created because what comes from that is not only secondary trauma, it's a vicarious trauma for those who have ancestors and family members who've lived, who've lived it, so most definitely. I would just like to say in nursing that we're committed to opening up the lines of communication and being, teaching the students to be open to other cultures uh, is a challenge and we try to work with uh, everybody, diverse populations, to help the students understand uh, and accept different cultures. So I appreciate that we had this time, you know, with the panel. It's been very helpful. And 
In closing, I just want to thank all of our panelists, Yolanda Bluehorse, Andrea Yarbrough, Tamika Minter, and Bonnie Smithers. And we really appreciate your time and your perspectives today. Um, the library would also again like to thank the U.S. National Library of Medicine, which developed and produced Native Voices, Native Peoples, Concepts of Health and Illness, and the American Library Association, Public Program Office, which in partnership with the National Libraries of Medicine towards the exhibition to America's libraries. After the panel, um, everyone is invited to visit the exhibit in the library, and we do have a fabulous library. And if you stop by from 3.30 to 4.30, Valerie will be celebrating the opening of the display with popcorn. And we will be hosting another event on Thursday. It's a 5 p.m. showing of Don't Get Sick After June, American Indian Healthcare, with an introduction and Q&A by the director of producer, Chip Ritchie. Um, so I want to thank all of you for spending time with us this afternoon. And again, let's thank our panelists.